Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So Joe, let me share my screen with you. Then we'll move on. Okay. All right, let's continue from where we started in the previous class. Uh, okay, we have started discussing about uniform flow. We have looked at some examples to determine the critical velocity, okay, and critical depth, depth of flow. Okay, now into uniform flow and then the channel design. Okay, I'm going to put it into presentation mode. Remember, I have already started discussing about the uniform flow. I'm going to say uniform flow occurs in a steady state only. That is when the flow doesn't change with time. Because when the, once the flow rate or the flow parameters changes with time, then definitely there will not be uniform flow. Okay, so it occurs in steady state only. And in uniform flow, the depth area of cross section velocity and discharge are the same at every section of a channel. Okay. And uh, the long channels may have only small reaches of uniform flow. However, it is the basic flow in channel hydraulics. Okay, so the basic flow, and we use it for the design of for channel design. Uh, okay, channel designs are based on consideration of the uniform flow. This we are going to see now. Okay, now in the hydraulics of common of uniform flow, the common approach in the United States is the Cheesy and Manning formula. These are the names of scientists that worked, you know, uh, does the development of the velocity in relation, in, in relation to the slope and hydraulic radius. Okay, so Chasey and Manning formula uh, developed in 1769 and 1889, respectively. Uh, there is conformity in the concept of Chasey and Darcy Westback that the head loss varies as the square of the velocity. Okay, that the head loss, okay, frictional head loss varies, so it's proportional to the square of the velocity, meaning the faster the liquid flows, the more the head loss. Okay, the slower it is, the less the head loss. We are going to see the Darcy Westback formula. Okay, I already wrote the Darcy Westback formula before, where it is equal to F. of uh, L over D, G squared over 2G. Okay, so you can see it varies with the square of the velocity. Friction factor, length, diameter, all these are constants. Okay, all these are constants. And Chase's formula can be derived by equating the propulsive force due to the weight of water in the direction of flow with the retarding shear force at the channel boundary. Okay, so simply, you know, using or um, applying the equilibrium equation that the fluid is flowing with uniform flow, with uniform velocity, because when fluid flows with uniform velocity, it is still in equilibrium, okay? And the summation of all forces acting on the fluid element will add up to zero. Okay, so this is the, uh, we are going to look at the diagram where we will balance you know the propulsive force due to the weight that's the force of due to gravity okay and then which will be balanced by the retarding shear force acting on the channel boundary that is the viscous forces okay and uh here we will have propulsive force in the direction of flow the weight component that's why you have sine theta the weight component in the direction of flow because you normally have some slope okay so when you have the fluid element the weight acting vertically downward w so it has this this is theta so it has component in the direction of flow okay if the channel bottom the bed slope is horizontal then it will not have any component in the direction of flow but more often than not you realize that the channel bottom has some slope has a bottom slope which is non-zero it can be very small but certainly non-zero for open channel flow because open channel flow is under gravity Okay, it utilizes gravitational force. So here you have the weight, which is simply 
you know, the weight is uh, uh, gamma W, okay, it's gamma times the volume, okay, volume is the area times the length, okay, and then the resisting force, because this is pushing forward the weight, and then the resisting force, the shear stress, which is the frictional force, okay, acting at this boundary, okay, which is resisting the movement of the fluid elements, okay, uh, is given as the shear force, as the shear stress times the area. Okay, this is the area. The weighted perimeter times the length. Okay, the weighted perimeter, which is P, times the length. That gives the area of the channel. This is irrespective of the shape of the channel. Okay, yeah, this area P times L is irrespective of the cross section, the cross section of the channel. It holds true. So this is the figure. Okay. Like I said, it's normally for open channel flow, you normally have the bottom slope theta, okay, which is designated as S naught. Okay, and this bottom slope, and you have the shear stress acting at the sides, okay, at the bottom and the sides, where it is in contact with the solid boundary. So the component, the weight is always acting vertically downward. This is W. But because of this angle, theta, because of this slope, it has component along this direction and along the flow direction. So this is the blue cos theta and this is the blue sine theta. So this is acting in the flow direction. And then this is opposite. Okay, so these are the only, not the only two forces, but we are going, in the next slide, we will analyze other forces because the other forces normally will cancel out when you have uniform flow. For instance, you will have the pressure forces acting. Okay, if it is, you know, the pressure force is simply the static pressure, gamma H or rho GH, isn't it? Okay, the pressure force, which is the same in both directions, is the Fx, Fx, which is the same, so they will cancel out. And you have the momentum, okay, the rate of change of momentum, because the velocity of flow is uniform, is the same, is constant. So you, it will not have acceleration. Acceleration is V dV dS, okay? Okay, so the change in velocity is zero, okay? So acceleration will turn out to be zero as well, okay? So you, you will have the momentum uh, to be the same, okay? The momentum force M1, this is going to be uh, MV1, which is also M2, which is MV2. But V1 equals V2. So, so in this case, you will have it to be the same. The momentum forces, I mean, the, there will be no change in momentum, all because of we have uniform flow where you have the velocity to be constant, okay? V2 equal V, V1 equal V2 equal V. Remember the definition of uniform flow, the velocity throughout the flow region, okay? Throughout the flow domain is constant throughout, irrespective of height, position, and time, okay? It is all the same. That's why we say uniform flow has to be steady because it has to be the same also with respect to time. So for that, you are left with only the gravity force, the blue sine theta, and the shear force, okay? And these two are equal now, okay? Uh, you know, from the Newton's, for the sum of all forces acting should be equal to zero in this case, because there is no acceleration. Otherwise, it would be equal to Ma, but the acceleration is zero, okay? So it is still a case of, you know, static equilibrium, because the fluid is moving with uniform velocity, okay? Hence the Hence, in this case, it is still static. It is still in equilibrium, okay? So these two forces must be equal in that case. And uh, for turbulent flow, the shear stress is proportional to V squared, which we can introduce a constant. And then for this, sine theta equal tan theta equal S. We are going to expatiate more on this because we will use the energy slope and the bed slope, okay? You know, for open channel flow, we normally have, or even for pipe flow, we have three types of slopes. We have the bed slope. This is the bed slope, okay, S naught. We have S naught, and we have the SW, slope of the water surface, okay, or slope of the hydraulic grid line. This you did in uh, fluid mechanics, hydraulic grid line. And then you have SE, slope of the energy, grid line 
energy grid line okay now in the next slide we are going to expatiate more on this and uh why sine theta equal tan theta equal just simply s okay i'll expatiate more using these three slopes because for uniform flow the s naught is equal to sw is equal to se because they are all parallel okay they are all parallel to one another okay and uh, when you substitute this here as shear stress and make v the subject of the formula you will find v to be equal to this and uh, here a, a area of a weighted perimeter is the radius hydraulic radius okay gamma over k all these are constants okay all these are constants so we can uh, simplify this to just a constant into square root of r s okay this is the chazy equation and c is the chazy's constant okay now i already started expatiating that uh, we have f equal ma okay which is the fluid kinematics now uh fluid kinetics because we are accounting for the forces causing the motion and when we try to analyze when you look at the figure now try to represent all the forces acting you have the weight acting okay the blue sine theta in the direction of flow because of the tilt because of the slope okay you have the pressure force f1 and f2 okay which are equal in this case because it's the static pressure which is just dependent on height the depth of flow y which is the same remember for uniform flow is when y is equal so this is y and this is y so y1 equals y2 okay so this is gamma h or oh, gamma y in this and this is also gamma y so f1 equals f2 and they are in the opposite direction because pressure is always compressive okay and then what else you have the momentum okay the momentum of this phase which is uh, mv1 okay which is and the momentum here is mv2 but remember the velocity of flow is constant also is v okay so v1 equals v2 so here you also have the momentum forces acting okay the force due to the momentum because ma is the rate of change of momentum okay and then so in this case m1 equals m2 okay because v1 equals v2 equals v and then talking about the energy grid line the hydraulic grid line is simply it is simply the height of the water table oh the height of the water surface okay this is the hydraulic grid line okay and then you have the energy grid line which is when you now include because you have the dynamic pressure this is the static pressure this depth is due to the static pressure which is gamma y okay and then you have the velocity head v squared over 2g which is representing the dynamic pressure okay which is representing the kinetic energy okay the static pressure is representing the potential energy the static pressure is representing the potential energy per unit volume okay and v squared over 2g is representing is giving us a, is a measure of the kinetic energy of the flowing fluid okay which is the velocity head which we call the velocity head okay and this is the pressure head okay and this is the velocity head okay and that is the energy grid line because according to the Bernoulli's principle when you have your datum okay and you have the elevation now z okay so the total head okay z plus y plus v at any section is the same okay so p over gamma which is the pressure head plus the velocity head v squared over 2g plus z is equal to a constant at any section okay and this gives us the total head okay this gives us we can use h the total head okay and the total head is the height of the energy grid line because all this can be converted to energy this is the pressure head uh, represent the flow energy the velocity head represents the kinetic energy and the uh, elevation the elevation it represents the potential energy okay it represents the 
potential energy. Although even the flow of energy or the um, um, pressure head it is also a measure of the potential energy of the liquid. But this is with respect to its height above datum, which can be zero. Okay. While this can be zero, the pressure head, as long as you have fluid flowing all the time, it will not be zero. But the datum can be zero depending on the reference elevation. Okay. On the reference elevation. Okay. So the total is the total head when you sum them up, which is the height of which gives the energy grade line. And when fluid is flowing, if we have constant velocity, then all the lines will be parallel. You know, the slope representing the bed, the bottom, is called S0. That of the water surface, SW. The energy line, okay, we call it SE. Okay, for uniform flow, when the velocity is constant, is uniform, and when the depth of flow is also uniform, is the same throughout, you will have all these to be parallel. S0 will be parallel to SW, will be parallel to SE. When fluid is flowing, because of the shear stress acting on the fluid elements, as it, because of the contact it is with the solid surfaces, there is energy, um, there is head loss, okay? There is head loss due to friction, HL. That's why, you see, here, uh, this is it. But when you move, the head loss is increasing. You can see that because as it is flowing, the head loss is increasing and it's proportional to the velocity squared. Okay, as it is moving, it is losing head because of the shear stress. It's just like you moving. When you start, you have maybe you ate food and you have, let's say, at this point, let's say you have 100 kilojoule of energy. When you move due to friction, due to working, you know, metabolic activities in your body, your energy you started with will be reducing with time and you will end up maybe with around 70 kilojoule, okay? Because you are losing energy when you are walking, when you are running, you are losing energy. The same thing with fluid element, okay? With the same thing with, although it is not human, okay? It doesn't feel, but it possesses energy. And that energy is being lost as it is uh, moving along the channel, okay? Um, so now you can see in, in this case, the momentum, change in momentum will be zero, okay? Okay, and then you will be only left with and change in the pressure force will be zero because F1 is equal to F2 because of the, that Y1 is equal to Y2. Okay, Y1 equals Y2. Okay, and this is the weighted perimeter, okay? And you know the weighted perimeter, which is including the bed, okay? All solid surfaces in contact with the fluid, okay? So this is the weighted perimeter. Okay, so now in this case, the shear stress will be acting on all these faces, okay, the bottom and the sides, okay, so that's why it's equal to, so the area will be equal to the shear stress times the area, and the area will be the weighted perimeter times the length of the channel, okay, times the length of the channel, and then here you sum all the forces to be zero or to be equal to the rate of change of momentum. Okay, so this is M1, which is minus M2, F1 minus F2, okay, because they are equal. So this is the way the gravity, and this is the shear force, okay? So we will be left with only WX and T, okay? And then, of course, uh, when we substitute, uh, this is WX and this is T bar, okay, we will end up with tau naught equal this. Okay, and then of course we have this one. B equals C square root of R S. Okay, uh, what else do I need to do? I want to add here. Yeah. Okay, so now if you look at it very well, the slope of the energy grid line S E. Okay, the slope of the energy grid line S E is simply HL, okay? This slope is simply HL over the length, over the length, okay? Which is L. Uh, 
uh, because this is uh, opposite of uh, the hypotenuse. So this is HL over the length here, which is L. Okay, this is L. And S naught, okay, is going to be this. No, I, I think I have another figure to show. Is going to be the uh, change in the elevation here. Okay, let's say delta Z over the length, the horizontal length of the channel. Okay which is, uh, I think I have another, so in summary, SE is given by tan theta, okay? And S naught is given by sine theta. But because theta is very small, when theta is small, sine theta in mathematics is equal to tan theta, when theta is very, very small, okay? And for that, SE is equal to S naught, okay? And for uniform flow, they are parallel, okay? They are parallel because of the velocity head is constant. And this is because V is constant. If V changes, then definitely they will not be parallel. Okay, all right. So this is the famous Chase's formula, okay, where C is a constant, Chase is constant, and C is the slope of energy line, which is equal to channel bottom for uniform flow. Okay, this I explain. Okay, is the slope of energy line, is the slope of the energy line, which is equal to the channel bottom for um, uniform flow. Okay. And that is why here, yeah. So three formulas. Uh, now we move to the Manning's equation. Three formulas by Gamblet and Cotter are commonly used to determine Chazy constant. One of these, the first formula is most satisfactory. It uses roughness coefficient n, which is almost equal to the Manning's coefficient. You see, with this, you can determine the velocity in open channel by knowing the Chazy constant, which is a constant, so we have no issue, the weighted perimeter, the hydraulic radius, which is area over the weighted perimeter, and the bed slope. So you see, all these are physical characteristics of the channel. So with the physical characteristics of the channel, determine the velocity of flow, simple. So which is like a simpler way rather than uh, uh you know all you need to know is you to know the area of the channel the weighted perimeter and the bed slot and then use the chases formula and then we have the manning's formula okay which is also uh the manning's formula is empirical okay it is empirical and is suitable for a fully rough turbulent flow okay and it is simply v equal one over n where n is manning constant okay manning Manning roughness coefficient. It is called Manning's roughness coefficient because it is a function of the channel uh, type. Okay, for a very rough channel, n is higher. For smoother channel, n is lower. Okay, and r to power of two over three and s to power of one over two. Okay, so uh, this is the uh, Manning's um, formula. Okay, and this is for metric unit. And for English unit, that's the empirical imperial unit. You have one point, almost 1.5 over n, okay? Uh, and then r will be in feet now. And bottom slope is dimensionless, okay? The slope is dimensionless. So this is the Chazy formula and this is the Manning formula, which are two most common ones used. And for the design of open channel, we'll be using mostly the Manning formula, okay? using the Manning formula and the two are somewhat equivalent when you replace c with r to power of 1 over 6 divided by n okay 
when you re replace c here to be equal to r to the power of 1 over 6 over the manning n, you will end up with the manning formula. Okay? You will end up with the manning formula. And like I said, the man, the manings, uh, the values of manning roughness coefficient depends on the bottom, on the sides, okay, on the solid boundary. For metal, you can see the value 0 0.01, 0 0.03, like that, okay. So it depends on how rough the surface is. You can see for an earth bottom, you can see the value increasing, okay, for masonry, natural streams, okay, for natural streams because it is usually rough, okay. On plain, clean, or no pool, zero point, you can see 0 0.07 sluggish, weedy, deep pools, okay, 0 0.07, okay. So these are some of the representative values of the man's roughness coefficient. Now, this is an example which says um, calculate the discharge through a three feet diameter circular clean earth channel clean half channel, running half full, okay? It is circular, three feet diameter, but running half full. The bed slope is one in 4,500, and minus N is 0 0.018, okay? So this is the bed slope, one in 4,500, okay? So this is the slope, okay? And uh, because it is running half full, so we can use open channel flow, concepts okay this is y n over d naught y n is the depth of flow it's running half full so it's uh, the diameter is three so the depth of flow is one over five so y n over d naught and then we now go back to that table okay which we can even use uh, no not this one the one that i have shown before okay uh, that table where you have ratio y over d not to be equal to this to get the value of a r to power because this is section factor for normal flow a r to power of two over three okay so we go to that table where y over d not equals this i have shown you the table before so just go where this ratio which is the first column y over d not is equal to 0 0.5 you will read the value for under a r to power of 2 over 3 over d naught to the power of 8 over 3 it will give you this so from here we can determine the section factor with the r to power of 2 over 3 okay by substituting the diameter and then the manning formula this we are using the imperial unit okay because it's uh, the constant over n and then this is a r to the power of 2 over 3 okay a r to power of two over three and uh, s to power of half. A r to power of two over three is already obtained here. Okay, so we just substitute it, which is two point nine two. Okay, and uh, we can do this in another way. That is to find the area of the full pipe, which is a circular section pi d squared over four. Okay, and then the hydraulic radius to find the equivalent r is equal to d over 4 how do we arrive at this hydraulic radius in open channel is area over weighted perimeter for pipe the area is what pi d squared over 4 divided by for pipe the weighted per perimeter is the circumference which is pi d so this cancels out d cancels so you have d over 4 so meaning the hydraulic radius for pipe flow is r equals d over 4 okay the hydraulic radius when applied to uh, pipe is equal to d over 4 d here is not delta flow is the diameter d here is the pipe diameter over 4 okay and this is exactly how how we obtain the reynolds number you know you know for pipe flow the reynolds number for laminar flow is 2000 and for open channel flow all we need to do in the the Reynolds number is V D over more. Okay, so this is diameter in pipe flow will be equal to four V times 
D now is equal to 4R. 4 times the hydraulic radius of a mole. Okay, so all we need to do is to divide this by 4. And this will give us 500 for open channel flow. Okay, that's why this, the equivalent of the Reynolds number formula for open channel flow, we use the hydraulic rate. Um, uh, here, D. If we use D here, or characteristic length, L. So L is equal to 4R. Okay, 4 times the hydraulic radius so now here we get the hydraulic radius and then we assume it is full and use the manning's formula okay and uh, here we have a we have r so we can we have s so we can simply substitute this is the flow rate now if it is half when we use this figure for v over q over q full equals half that is flowing half we take it here to get the ratio of y over d naught, which is also half, okay? Which is also half y over d naught. So, so which means here q is equal to 0 0.5 q full, okay? Because it's flowing half, okay? So 0 0.5 times the full flow. And we obtain the same answer as we got before, 3.6. Okay. Now, oh, uh, yeah, I was, uh, th this is to just, okay, I think I will take it. Uh, so. Uh, we'll take this slide back to this one. No, not even here. To the point where I was explaining the slope, which sine theta equal. Okay, yeah, it is supposed to be here. Yeah, I was still explaining the energy grid line, the hydraulic grid line, because it's very important. Yeah, this is, you know, from the uh, Bernoulli equation, when you have two points in flow, okay, point one and point two, this is the Bernoulli or the energy equation, because here we are including the head loss, because in the Bernoulli equation, you is assuming that there is no head loss, okay? which is true to some certain extent, depending on some conditions, but in actual sense, because when you are neglecting the viscous forces, there will be no head loss. But normally, uh, in some regions, yes, it's true, but in other regions, close to the boundary, you cannot neglect the viscous forces. So you have head loss, okay? And the depth is the same, okay? Also, the velocity is the same, so you have, the energy line grid line to be parallel to the this is the energy grid line se this is the hydraulic grid line and this is the bed slope s naught okay so here when you apply Bernoulli uh, the energy equation for these two points you realize that i mean the pressure the pressure head is simply the depth of the water okay the velocity is the same and uh, if it's the same so it will just cancel out and the pressure head will also cancel out so the head loss is which is hl okay is simply given by the difference in elevation z1 minus z2 okay and the head loss for unit length of channel okay for unit length of uh, channel, uh, channel length is the energy line, which is the hydraulic slope. Okay, the head loss per unit length of the channel, okay, which is this inclined length, okay, is HL over L, okay, which is Z1 minus Z2 over L. If you look at it, this is simply sine alpha, which is the angle, 
which is sine is opposite over hypotenuse. The opposite is HL, the hypotenuse is L. Okay, so this is sine alpha. Okay, and since in open channel flows, the slope is generally a small value. So alpha is very small, five degrees to 10 degrees. Okay, so, and uh, here the bed slope, the bed slope is given, the bed slope S0 is given by HL over delta X, which is the horizontal length. Because the bed slope, this is the difference in elevation, which is Z1 minus Z2, okay? If you take Z1 to be at this point, okay? So, which is HL, okay? And then divided by delta x, okay, which is the bed slope. So the bed slope now, this is opposite over adjacent, which is tan. So that's why it is tan alpha, okay, okay. This is alpha, the same alpha here, okay, because this is parallel to this, is parallel to that. These three lines are all parallel, okay. So this is tan alpha. HL over delta X. SE is HL over L, and L is not the horizontal length, it's the inclined length of the energy grid line. Okay, so here because theta is very small, sine theta is equal to tan, sorry, tan alpha is equal to sine alpha because theta is very small. And sine alpha is what? The slope of the energy grid line, tan alpha is the bed slope S0, okay? And of course, th they are also parallel to SW. So, S SE equal S0 equal uh, SW, which is the uh, hydraulic grid line, okay? And uh, the conclusion here is that hydraulic grid line, which is SW, coincides with water surface slope in every kind of open flows. Since the velocity will remain constant in every cross section at uniform flows, energy line slope, which is SE, hydraulic grid line slope, which is the water surface slope, which is SW, and channel bottom slope, which is S0, are equal to each other and will be parallel as well. So S is simply equal to S0 equal to SE, where S is the water surface slope. So they are all equal for uniform flow. Okay, so now let's move on to uh, this one. Okay. Now, here we have a trapezoidal channel. Okay, we have a trapezoidal channel of bottom width, 25 feet is the bottom width, which is B. Okay. And side slope one to two point five. One to two point five. Sometimes it's better it is indicated. Okay, but normally uh, we give the vertical followed by the horizontal. Okay, like here it doesn't mention one vertical. Okay, and then uh, two point horizontal. So no, normally we start with the vertical if it is not indicated. But to be clear, okay. In most of the problems, it will be clearly mentioned one vertical, then to 2.5 horizontal. Okay, so this is the side slope. Okay, one vertical, 2.5 horizontal, and carries a discharge of 450 cubic feet per second with a normal depth of 3.5 feet. The elevations at the beginning and end of the channel are 685 and 650 feet, respectively. Determine the length of the channel if n equals 0 0.02. So we want the length of the channel. So we need to do some geometry here. First of all, the area of the, the cross-sectional area, because we need to determine A, the weighted perimeter, and R. We want to use the Manning formula. And you know, in the Manning formula, we have Q equal A, R to the power of 2 over 3, S to the power of half over n. OK, so we need A, we need R. And uh, we also need S. Okay, uh, we want the length of the channel. Okay, we want to de determine the length of the channel. Q is given. 
we can find a we can find s and uh r s that, that is the slope can also be found okay it can also be found from this and then we use the definition of the slope which is you know change in elevation okay which is delta z okay over l okay because determine the length of the channel delta z over l okay which is what i just finished explaining now so we need to start with the area which is this one okay for trapezium for trapezium we divide it into uh, the area of a trapezium is half some of the parallel sides times height we have b here which is equal to this but what about these sides okay the top width total top width okay this we have to use a similar triangle okay similar triangle this is usually one to z this we call it z okay and then this is y let's say this is x we want to find x so we use similar triangle one over z or x over y x over y is equal to z over 1 so x is simply z y z is a horizontal component of the slope okay because the slope is usually given one is to something okay one is to something one is the vertical okay and then the horizontal component of the slope is z so it means that x is equal to z so this portion is simply z y and this one is also z y okay so the top width for trapezium is going to be b which is this one okay plus what 2 z y okay so this is how we can simply calculate the top width which is very simple so in this case it's going to be 25 plus 2 times z in this case is 2.5 plus y here is 3.5 and this will give you when you add everything up 42.5 okay so this is the top width okay and now the weighted perimeter again it has to be b plus this side now this this is gy which we found so what about this side we can also use the same similar triangle to find this side okay if this is one to z then what is this one the hypotenuse is square root of one plus z squared okay so uh if we call this x uh, let me call this uh, uh x y z let me call it a okay so a over y i'm using similar triangle a is from here to here over y which is from here to here okay the depth okay is equal to now this from here to here which is oh which is square root of 1 plus z squared from here to here over the vertical one which is 1 so a here is simply y into 1 plus z squared remember i have a on this side and i also have a on the other side so the weighted perimeter is now going to be b plus 2a okay so it's going to be b plus 2a is what? 2y into square root of 1 plus z squared. So this is the weighted perimeter for rectangular section. And this is the top width for rectangular section. Okay, and this is the simple derivation. I had some of you type in. So let me take to see uh, typing. uh 8.75 over 3.5 what is this 
equal to 2.5. What do you want to say here, Amjad? Hello? Okay. So let me go back to the presentation mode. So like I say, the top width for trapezoidal channel is B plus 2ZY, and the uh, weighted perimeter is B plus 2Y into bracket 1 plus Z squared. But this is when, if the channel is, the side slope is given as 1 to something, be, be, because the, rate of the side channel is usually 1 to something, which is Z. In case let's say it's not giving one to something let's say it's giving two to three so you can divide you can make this one by dividing throughout by two so it becomes one is to 1.5 now so you want to take the ratio first before applying this formula because this formula the side slope is given as one to ratio z okay so this is very important so from here, this is the uh, area computed using, you know, the area of a trapezium. Half some of the parallel sides times height. Parallel sides will be 25 B T, which is 42.5 times the height, which is Y, and then the uh, uh, the weighted perimeter. Okay, the weighted perimeter now is going to be B which is 25 plus this side 2a, isn't it, which is this, okay? Or you can simply apply this formula. When you apply this formula straight, you will get this value, okay? And then the hydraulic radius is a over p, which is this. And then using the money equation, we have everything. Q is provided in the, has been provided in the uh, uh, problem, and then we can simply substitute to find s. A, we found S, we found R, N is a constant which was given, so we can find S, which is this. And S, by definition, is change in Z, which is the H1 minus H2. You remember, we are given uh, the elevations at the beginning and end of the channel, so it's like this, okay? So the elevation with respect to that one, okay? Okay, so at this point, it is 685 this point it is 650 okay so what is this one which is delta z which is h1 minus h2 okay and then divide by the uh length okay which is l because we want to determine the length of the channel okay so s is h1 minus h2 over l okay and this is because you know the bed slope is very small so this will be approximately equal to this one, okay? Because the angle is very small, okay? So here, this is what we need, the length, okay? Uh, in the actual sense, this is what we determine as L, but because this angle is very small, so this L will be approximately equal to the length of the channel, okay? And uh, to take the next one, channel design. Let's take a break for some few minutes. When we come back, we'll continue with channel design.
All right, gentlemen, let's move on. <coughs> Now we go to channel design, okay? Channel design comprises determining the channel depth and other dimensions along with the bed slope, okay? Channel depth, breadth, bed slope, okay? And there are four types of problems related to channel design. The first one is the rigid boundary channels carrying sediment-free water. Rigid boundary channels, Rigid, it means that the, the boundary of the channels are rigid, meaning, you know, they are dug maybe in rocks or lined. If it is lined with concrete, if it is dug in rock area, then it will be rigid, meaning it will not be movable. It, it, can, it is non-erodible, okay? Or like when you dug your channel in said or uh, uh, in soil when you dug your channel in soil without lining it as the flow as the water is flowing in the channel it will be eating away the sides of the channel as well as the bottom so that is non-rigid boundary channel but here we are starting with rigid boundary channel carrying sediment free water meaning the water does not have debris okay it does not have sediment okay all this will change, the design considerations will change if it is carrying sediment laden water. Okay, so we will take this, and then there are other types, uh, you, you know, the rigid boundary channels carrying sediment laden water. Laden, it means that the water is containing sediment. Okay, and then you have the fourth type, which is loose boundary channel carrying sediment free water. Loose boundary, like, you know, channel in soil dog in soil okay without lining okay without lining okay carrying sediment free water and also loose boundary channels carrying sediment laden water once you understand the first one the understanding the other three will be very easy so uh, for that we will only treat the first one and then uh, the design for all the other four are also contained in the book but the first one is the most important one. The remaining ones are just like when you have sediment, okay, probably uh, the tractive force, the velocity, the minimum velocity should increase so as not to avoid deposition of the sediment, okay? When it is loose boundary and without sediment, the velocity in the tunnel will reduce because when the velocity is high, it will be eating away the boundary, okay? When it is loose boundary and sediment laden, then you know, uh, the slope has to be adjusted, the slope in with respect and as well as the velocity, okay? So all these uh, minor modifications uh, can be done first one. So we will look at the first one in detail. Now design of region boundary channels carrying sediment free water. The design of a channel that is caught in rock or constructed with lining, by lining here, you use concrete usually to line the uh, channel. When you have, let's say a channel, this is in soil, so you line it. Put some depth, you know, some concrete, okay? Okay, so this is the concrete, okay? So this is the lining. It's based on the uniform flow condition described in the previous section. We will describe the uniform flow. So the design is based on the uniform flow. In practice, we mentioned that uh, the flow that is actually um, uh, existing in our channels is non-uniform flow. But the non-uniform flow, I mean, is really complicated to deal with. Uniform flow is the easiest one you can deal with. Uniform, steady flow, okay, uh, without having to get, uh, you know, the variation of velocity with respect to time, you know, with respect to space and all of that. So it makes the design really simple. Uh, yet, uh, although it, uh, there is some compromises, but still, uh, it is still um, uh, accurate enough, okay, for practical purposes, for practical purposes. However, in order to design all channel dimensions, Additional relations and criteria are needed. 
besides Martin's equation, we need some other additional criteria which we are going to mention. These additional things are based on the following considerations. Okay. We will look at the considerations. Uh, but here, for white channel, for white rectangular channel, the hydraulic radius is approximately equal to the depth. Okay. For rectangle, this is the area. The hydraulic radius is A over P. For rectangular channel, area is BY and weighted perimeter is B plus 2Y. Okay. When you divide by B up and down, you have this. Okay. When B tends to 0, which is the breadth, R tends to 0. Because when B tends to 0, this is 0, this collapses. Okay. So the hydraulic radius is 0. But what about when B to infinity? Meaning for wide channel, the breadth is very wide. Okay. So it tends to infinity. When, when it tends to infinity, now this term becomes zero because it will be two over infinity, which is um, zero. So it will be y over one, which is y. So r tends to y. Or even if you consider this one, when b tends to infinity, it means that this is very small compared to b. Okay, so you will be left with b y over y. So b will cancel b, leaving y. So r tends to y for wide rectangular channel. So from this, it may be concluded that for wide shallow rectangular cross sections, r is approximately equal to the depth of the channel. Okay. Now, what are these other considerations? We will mention them here. Okay. You know, here we say these additional elements are based on the following considerations. So, uh, and you see, another thing I want to portray here, channel, open channel flow is solely the work or the area of a civil engineer. Okay. I told you from the beginning that, you know, water engineering or fluid mechanics, for those that took fluid mechanics with me, I told you that, you know, it is common between mechanical, chemical and civil engineers. Okay. The mechanical engineers mostly deal with fluid and then they as liquid in pipes as well as gas. Okay. As well as gas. The same thing with the chemical engineers. They look at liquid, as maybe petrol, chemicals, and what have you, as well as the gaseous phase, okay, the gases. But the civil engineer, his main concern with fluid is water. And water, again, he deals with water in pipe flow as well as in open channel. For pipe flow, the chemical engineer may look at the connection, you know, in the pipes in a building. Okay, that is the design of a mechanical engineer. But when it is related to a town, municipal water supply, okay, the water distribution system in a town, then that is taken care of solely by the civil engineer. The mechanical engineer can take care of the pumps, you know, and all that, the appurtenances. But the design of the water distribution system, which is the next chapter, chapter 15, that we are going to look at, is the... Uh, exclusive area of the civil engineer okay that is with respect to the pipe flow with respect to the open channel flow that is a no-go area for a mechanical engineer or even the um, um, chemical engineer that is sole reserve of the um, civil engineer okay because normally when we're talking about open channel flow we are discussing about rivers streams Okay, and all these are used for supply of water, for water resources development, for supply of water, for municipal water supply. And this is the sole reason why it is called civil. Okay, civil is something having to do with the masses, okay, that affects the masses like buildings, roads, you know, water supply, and all this. Okay, that's why it is called civil. So the open channel flow section is solely an area that is explored by the civil engineers alone, okay? So let's move on. Design of rigid boundary channels carrying sediment-free water. So let's look at the first one of the most important aspect here is the bottom longitudinal slope, okay? Because open channel flow are using gravity, okay? They are flow that take place uh, uh, under gravity, 
unlike pipe flow. Pipe flow, you can just use pump to pump it, okay? But open channel flow, it usually takes place under gravity. The topography of the area, the catchment, is what is, you know, satisfying the head requirements. This is governed by the topography and head requirements. Okay? And by topography, it means you must have, like, slope, okay? And that's the bottom longitudinal slope. It has to be sloping down because water has to move from higher energy level to lower energy level. And by higher energy level here, we are referring to the potential energy because at higher elevation, you know, the water possesses higher potential energy than at lower elevation. Hence, when you have difference in energy level, the water can flow. Okay, and the driving force here is the difference in energy level, which is given by the difference in elevation. Because like I mentioned, the elevation is a function of the potential energy. Potential energy is simply mgh, okay? This is the height. Mass is constant, g is constant. The only thing that varies is h, okay, above a particular datum, okay? So this is governed by the topography, which is the shape of the, you know, um, catchment, the surface, top soil, uh, you, you know the shape of the surface of the earth and the head requirements okay. when the two ends of a channel are fixed okay when the two ends are fixed and the channel has to be laid on a predetermined alignment the slope gets fixed accordingly when you have two ends of a channel let's say this is the point one this is point two and they are fixed okay, so this is the topography okay so the channel i mean the slope get predetermined alignment okay so the alignment is going to be this so this is go, going to be the slope okay and this is going to be the direction of movement okay so the slope gets fixed accordingly the conveyance channels for water supply okay the conveyance channel for water supply irrigation and hydropower okay require a higher level at the point of delivery and therefore have a relatively small slope if they require higher level at the point of delivery, then the slope is going to be smaller. Like when you have this way, okay? This slope is smaller than this slope, okay? In circular pipes, the slopes required for pipes flowing full at a minimum velocity of 0 0.6 meter per second and a value of N of about 0 0.015 are indicated the table below for various magnitudes of flow according to a study by Pomeroy. okay this value is the minimum velocity that we want to have in our channel okay or in our pipes okay is the minimum velocity to avoid deposition okay so for this when you have flow of this okay this is the slope okay depending on the flow rate okay okay depending on the flow rate you have the slope you know feet per 1000 feet okay which is increasing as the flow rate increases the slope decreases okay you can see as the flow rate increases the slope decreases okay so this goes to tell you that higher flow rate okay requires less slope Okay, but molar flow rate need higher slope. Okay. Now, channel side slopes. We have started discussing about side slopes with respect to trapezoidal channel. Okay. The channel side slopes depend on the type of material of the channel. And a nearly vertical slope is recommended for a, com for a channel comprised of rocks. While a slope of one vertical to three horizontal is recommended for sandy soil. One vertical to three horizontal, it means it is going to be trapezoidal. Okay. One vertical, three horizontal. Okay. But uh, uh, rectangular, I mean, has, you know, the slope is vertical. Okay. So it is just vertical. So in that case, z is just zero okay so this is recommended for sandy soil okay when you have sandy soil and this is to avoid caving in okay because if you have rectangular it can fold the soil particle in sand you know it can 
cave in and fill the channel and reduce the effective capacity of your channel. Okay, so to reduce this, it's better to have this slope. The Bureau of Reclamation prefers a 1 to 1.5 slope for usual sizes of lined canals. Okay, lined canals are also channels. Canals is also another name for a channel. Okay, but normally, like when you say canal, like irrigation canal and all that. Now, another issue is freeboard. Okay, freeboard uh, here is the distance between the maximum water level to the top of the channel. Okay, this is, you know, lining freeboard. Okay, uh, this is the lining. Okay. So meaning we're expecting the maximum water level to be this, okay? And this is the maximum depth of the channel. So this difference, okay, between the maximum water level and the top of the channel is called the free board, okay? This is the vertical distance from the water surface to the top of the channel, okay? And we normally allow it to avoid over spilling, over overflowing the channel because when water flows full on, you know, here, any slight variation in the flow rate, it will spill over, okay? There will be flooding, okay? And this, this will, I mean, portend dangers to other areas close to the embankment, okay? Close to the channel embankment, okay? So that's why you provide, like, some factor safety that, okay, this is the normal depth of flow, and then there is, like, some allowance in case the flow rate increases okay there is some allowance to avoid spilling over of the water from the channel to adjacent sites this will be sufficient to prevent overtopping of the channel by waves or a fluctuating water surface the bureau of reclamation has recommended the following formula for the freeboard u equal cy okay where u is this freeboard okay in feet this is the imperial uh, formula and c is a coefficient varying from 1.5 for a capacity of 20 cubic feet per second to 2.5 for a capacity of 3000 cubic feet per second and y is the depth in the canal okay why why is the depth in the canal so this is why the depth in the canal and c is a constant that depends on the flow rate okay and u is the free board okay which is the allowance the vertical uh height or distance from the water surface to the top of the channel now another issue is is the hydraulic cross efficient sections as the name implies hydraulic efficient sections okay which sections are best and based on what parameters this is what we are going to discuss here the best or the most efficient cross-section for a given flow rate, manning's coefficient, and bed slope, the one with a minimum excavation and minimum lining cross-section. Minimum excavation, it will reduce cost. Minimum lining cross-section, it will also reduce cost, okay? Because in design, you are going to see that cost is one of the most important parameters in design, okay? Because you can come up with all the fancy designs, but your client has to be able to, I mean, implement that design to the letter. If he doesn't have sufficient amount of money to implement it, then that will be problematic. And that is why more often than not in design, you normally come up with alternative designs, okay? Whose cost will vary, okay? And then the client uh, will now be, you know, up to him to choose, I mean, based on the cost and other considerations. It is not only cost that is the main consideration, but cost in design is one of the most important aspects. And that is why engineers are also uh, required to learn about economics, okay? To learn about economics. So here, in order to have minimum excavation, minimum lining cross-section, the area has to be minimum, okay? the area has to be minimum
the area has to be minimum and uh, that is to have minimum excavation you know this area is different from this area isn't it so the volume of excavation reduces and that will reduce the labor cost minimum lining cross section the weighted perimeter has to be minimal okay because if you are going to line with concrete okay the lining cross section is a function of the weighted perimeter okay the lining cross section is a function of the weighted perimeter so the minimum cross section area and minimum lining area will reduce construction expenses and therefore that cross section is economically the most efficient one okay is economically the most efficient one so here we are saying hydraulic econo uh, efficient sections okay and how do we achieve this velocity is q over a okay so a is minimum v should be maximum isn't it so when you have uh, when v is maximum when v is maximum this is from the manning's formula okay this is from the manning's formula you see there is no a here so that's why we have v okay when v is maximum these are constant bed slope and n are all constant when v is maximum it means r is also maximum that is you know for most efficient section the velocity has to be maximum the weighted perimeter has to be minimum but the hydraulic radius has to be maximum okay the hydraulic radius has to be maximum of course if this is minimum the weighted perimeter then this is also maximum similar to the relationship between v and a the best hydraulic section cross section for a given area uh, minus roughness coefficient and bed slope is the section that conveys maximum discharge okay for a given area the cross section that conveys maximum discharge for a given area okay and the cross section with the minimum weighted perimeter is the best hydraulic cross section within the cross sections with the same area you may have the same area but the weighted perimeter vary so the one with the minimum weighted perimeter is the best cross section okay with the same area since lining and maintenance expenses will reduce substantially this is the manning's formula okay all these are constant if we keep the other constant okay so q varies with r so if r is maximum then q should be maximum also okay uh, so for most efficient section q should be maximum the flow rate the hydraulic radius should be maximum but the weighted perimeter should be minimum okay the weighted perimeter should be minimum for all base hydraulic cross section the hydraulic radius should always be r equal y over 2 for most of them okay regardless of their shapes regardless of their shape this is true this is true for a rectangle which is half a square you can see r okay equal to this and this is the top width okay which is the length of water surface width okay which is which we call the top width t okay and this is trapezoidal half regular hexagon for trapezoidal also r equals y over 2 for circular so same is uh, for circular or semicircle r equals y over 2 okay for triangle r equals y over 2 root 2 okay and this you can prove them you can prove all these formulas okay you can prove all this for rectangle this is b this is y area equal b y okay um uh, weighted perimeter b plus 2y isn't it because this is y y okay and then you need to reduce the weighted to 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 have p minimum when you differentiate the p dy it should be equal to zero because when it is zero that is when you you have p to be minimum remember maxima and minima in calculus okay okay when dp dy equals zero that is when p is minimum okay when dp dy equals zero so you just differentiate this with respect to uh, y okay and 
B here can be expressed in terms of A, which is A over Y plus 2Y. Okay. And when you differentiate this, the P dy, it will be equal to uh, minus A over Y squared equals to, so you will have A equal 2Y squared. Okay. Which is this one. Okay. And when A equals 2Y squared, what is now R? So R is A over P. So, oh So, uh, the weighted perimeter now, if you substitute, what is your B now? B is. Uh, a over y and a is 2y squared over y so b is now equals to 2y you can see that this is it isn't it and what is your p okay is b plus 2y so this is 2y plus 2y which is 4y and this is the weighted perimeter okay and the top width is simply equals to b which is equal to 2y okay so you can repeat the same thing for trapezium for circular sections and you will get all these values here okay but the most important thing is that the hydraulic radius will always be equal to y over 2 okay hydraulic radius will always be equal to y over 2 irrespective of the section regardless of the, sh uh, the shape Now, for a given slope, a roughness coefficient, the discharge increases with an increase in the section factor. Why? For, 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 this is the section factor for normal flow, which according to uh, Manning equation, QN, okay? So for, for, for a given slope and discharge, okay, uh, the, uh, no, for for a given slope, the the discharge increases with the section factor. Okay, for a given slope and n. Okay, uh, the discharge Q varies with the section factor. So this can be explained using the Manning equation. Okay, and for a given area, the section is highest. Okay, so here we will try to get maximum section factor. Okay, and for a given area, the section factor is highest for the least weighted perimeter, least meaning minimum, okay? And this is also using the section factor formula. Okay, A, R. A is, R is simply A over P. So when, when A, for a given area, the section factor is highest for least when P is minimum, then Zn is maximum. Okay, so for a given area, the section factor is highest for the least weighted perimeter. The expressions for the weighted perimeter can be written in terms of the depth for various channel shells. This we did in the previous table. Its minimization by differentiating and equating to zero provides the depth relation of the base hydraulic section. This we did, you know, for even a rectangle in the previous slide. From hydraulic efficiency consideration, a semicycle is the best section. For an open channel this is very important a semicycle is the best section for an open channel and the best closed section flowing is a cycle you know you, you can have like a rectangular pipe okay or types of other shapes but the best one flowing full is a cycle while for open channel is a semicycle which is the most efficient section any reasonably shaped open section is more efficient than a closed conduit Okay, any reasonably shaped open section is more efficient than a closed conduit section flowing full. Okay, the dimensions of a channel are not governed entirely by the hydraulic efficiency, but by practical and cost consideration. Practical consideration, here we'll look at maybe the uh, state of the ground surface, the topography, and all that, and the slope. Okay, all this will dictate sometimes the shape of the uh, section to have okay then cost is one of the most important thing because each one will come with a different cost 
okay each section you choose will come with a different cost but here it's also very good to note that any reasonably shaped open section is more efficient than a closed conduit so this is very important open section is more efficient than closed uh, closed conduit so trapezoidal sections are very common and they are very common because constructing semicycle has a lot of challenge okay so semicycle constructing a semicircular channel has great challenge so that's why the one that's closest to a semicycle is trapezium you look at it you know you know so it's somehow closer to uh, a semicircular channel so that's why you have trapezoidal sections to be more common and hydraulic efficient sections still on that the following properties are related to the best hydraulic section where these have to be changed for practical considerations trapezoidal section the base hydraulic section never has a base width larger than the depth of water so the base width is not greater than the depth of water okay rectangular section the width is twice the depth in the base hydraulic section okay the width is twice the depth b equal to y this we have seen in the table i provided below um, before this two, uh, before this slide and for triangular section side slots are selected by practical consideration and for circular section a semicycle is the best section for channels open at top and a cycle is the best as a closed section so what are the design procedures the design procedures are simply, you know, the first one you select and you select S, that is the bed slope and estimate N from available data. You know, sometimes N, we have seen a table in which you can go and select the value of the Manning coefficient and then substitute in the Manning's formula to determine the section factor, okay? The section factor, okay? Substitute to uh, determine the section factor, okay? because the flow rate will also be provided. And then from there, you select the side slope Z and assume B over Y as necessary, okay? Express AR to the power of two over three in terms of the depth. Solve for the depth as in the preceding section. And uh, assuming several values of the unknowns, a number of sections, uh, section dimensions can be obtained to make a cost comparison because from the section factor you can select a number of different sections and you have to add a free board to the water depth for an open section okay this we will uh, implement all these steps in the following example okay and uh, storm sewers and wastewater sewers are designed by the procedure above except for the computation of the quantity of flow because storm sewers and wastewater sewers like i mentioned before they are designed as open channel flow flows okay Despite the fact that they will be using pipe, okay, but the pipe will not be flowing full, okay, so they are still open channel case, okay, so, and then storm discharge is computed based on the drainage area and wastewater flow from the quantity of water supply, okay, that is storm discharge. If the channel is to drain the storm water, okay, so that should be computed, that is the Q, we're talking about Q, the flow rate. Okay, the flow is computed from the drainage area as well as the wastewater flow from the quantity of water supply. Normally, we take about, let's say, about 80% of the quantity of water supply to end off in the sewers. Because if you remember in chapter one, we made mention of the per capita consumption, okay, per capita flow, per capita need, water demand, okay, and we talked about the consumptive use, which is the amount of water that is not returned as waste. Okay, which is very small, about maybe 10% thereabout. But 90% of water demand is ending up as waste because when you take a shower, the water ends as waste water. Okay, when you flush, when you wash your car, all the water will, I mean, very few amount is used in cell development. Okay. Now, this is an example for the design, you know, of the channel says a district has a drainage area of uh, 2,500 acres with a population of 20 persons per acre, okay? The daily water supply to the district 
is 40 gallons per person. So from this, we can determine the wastewater. It has been observed that 10% of this flow passes along the sewer. Okay, this is the daily water supply, 10 gallons per person, and 10% of this flow passes along the sewer between the hours of 7 and 8 a.m. If the sewer consists of vitrified clay, okay, laid at 0 0.1 grade, that is the slope, okay, design the sewer. Okay, so here for vitrified clay, okay, N is this value, and uh, the slope has been provided 0.1% grade, which is 0 0.1 over 100, okay. So we have N and S, and we have to determine Q, total water supply, which here we have acres, total water supply. Uh, remember, we are giving 20 persons, we, we, we have 2,500 acres, and each acre has 20 persons, and each person has uh, 40 gallons per person, okay? So it will be acres times person per acre times supply per person, okay? So you can see this will cancel that. Acre will cancel acre, so at the end we'll be left with the supply. Okay, so we will multiply everything. So this is our Q, which is two times ten to the power of six gallons per day. Okay, flow passing to the sewer in one hour. Okay, we are told that in one hour, seven to eight, ten percent of this flow is passing to the sewer, which is like the peak flow rate. Okay, the peak flow rate, and we design using the peak flow rate. Okay. Flow passing to the sewer in one hour. Okay, this is per day. Okay, so in one hour is 0 0.1%, 10% of this, okay, which is this value, which is this. Okay, so this is our design flow rate, okay, which is the maximum flow rate into the sewer. We design for the maximum discharge, okay, and from the Manning's formula, AR to power of 2 over 3, QN over this, Q is known, N is known, S is known. Okay, so this is and this is the section factor okay the section factor for normal flow okay and uh, we now go to that table okay table 11.1 .1, and uh, we know for maximum flow for pipe flow operating at open as open channel the maximum flow occurs when the depth of flow is 0 0.94 okay so at this we read our ar okay Because we want to find the size of the channel, okay, the size of the pipe, okay? We want to find the size of the pipe. So at this value, we trace, okay, so the, the, we have this as the section factor, okay? Don't forget, we already know the section factor. So we can find D, which is the diameter, okay, which is 197 feet. Okay, of course, you may not find exactly one uh, a pipe whose diameter is 197 feet. M maybe it will be like 200 feet, 250, okay, like that. So you take the next one, okay, for practical purposes. So this is like some simple demonstration of the design of open channel. Although this is pipe flow, but it is not actually pipe flow because it is open channel. It is not, okay, any question? Any question? Oh, okay. Okay, so till we meet in the lab today, okay? Uh, we meet in the lab today, group two, we will perform two experiments. So be there exactly at 2.20. Be there exactly at 2.20 for group two.